negotiated the structure for debate in the House on the health care reform bill offered by Majority Leader Richard Gephardt. The bill guarantees coverage to all Americans by 1999. Employers would pay 80 percent of their workers' insurance. The House Rules Committee is chaired by Democratic Congressman Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts. This hearing runs about three hours. Rules Committee will now come to order. There's been a request for filming of portions of today's proceedings, as well as the taking of still photographs. Is there any objection? Without objection. Chair, here's none. Uh, today, the Rules Committee begins hearing what will be a great deal of testimony on health care reform and all the various proposals to cure what ails our system. We have the best hospitals, we have the best doctors, nurses, and other health care providers in the world. And everybody looks to America for breakthroughs in medical technology, for new drugs, for advances in biotechnology. We've got the best medical care and the best medical research that money can buy. And there's the rub. Not everyone in this country is covered, and even those with coverage can lose it forever. When someone changes jobs or the economy turns sour and they are temporarily laid off. 49,000 people in Massachusetts lose health care coverage every month. We've got to end the exclusion for pre-existing conditions. We've got to make health care insurance portable, portable. And we've got to guarantee health insurance that can never be taken away. If we do not, without universal coverage, people who buy insurance will be those who need it the most. That drives up the cost of premiums, uh, so even more healthy individuals and small businesses back out of the cost of insurance uh, that will escalate further. At the rate we are going, Americans will spend one dollar out of every five dollars for health care by the year 2000. If we do nothing, the annual health care bills for Massachusetts families will go from $9,000 a year to $18,000 a year by the, the year 2000. So today, in the next step to getting our health care costs under control, the Rules Committee will hear from members proposing full-scale alternatives and from members offering perfecting amendments. And when we finish today's testimony, we will keep these hearings open to hear from the members who are still drafting individual perfecting amendments and others who can't testify here today. <laughs> this time I'd like to recognize the ranking minority member, uh, Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> well, I, uh, I thank our distinguished chairman of our, uh, our committee. And Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, here we are. <laughs> there are literally thousands of pages here of the some 10 substitutes to the uh, to this critical era of issue. Uh, uh, I commend you on calling this hearing to develop a process for the historic health care debate that does lie ahead uh, in the United States House of Representatives. And judging from the list of witnesses that we uh, have that are going to be testifying today and tomorrow, uh, there is no lack of interest on ideas of how to address this issue. And perhaps that's good. The chairman, uh, I'd like to offer a few comments and suggestions upon the process we are charged with developing without going into the substance or controversies involved with the competing health care proposals presented to us uh, at these hearings. As you all know uh, and all are aware, last night at 6 p.m., uh, that was the deadline for filing substitute bills with the Rules Committee. There have been a variety of proposals submitted, 10 of them uh, altogether. And we have our work cut out for us in trying to fashion a process that will be as fair as possible to all 435 members of this, this body. It's my understanding that if a unanimous consent request is not agreed to on the House floor for general debate on this issue, and uh, at the present time I would uh, object to that uh, unanimous consent request, although that's subject to negotiation, 
this committee will be called on first to then grant a rule providing for a general debate time. We would then come back next week and grant a rule provided for a structured amendment process. And, Mr. Chairman, while I'm somewhat hesitant to even begin general debate before copies of the major substitutes have been nailed down in their final form and made available to each and every member, I'm willing to go along with the leadership's wishes that we begin that debate uh, next Tuesday, if that's what uh, we see fit to do. I think that that would be an excellent opportunity for the sponsors of the various substitutes submitted to explain the provisions of their proposals and for other members to listen and to learn and to question each other about these bills. It will also be a very valuable learning period for the American people, most of whom have not had a chance to focus on the specific aspects of these bills and how they might impact their lives. But, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, submit that we have an obligation not just to listen and learn from each other, but that uh, during the initial general debate on the various health care reform proposals, we have another obligation. We have a very special obligation on legislation of this magnitude, a massive new program that will touch the lives and the livelihood of every single American in this country to go back home and to listen to our constituents before we cast our votes on these alternative packages. And they are extremely comprehensive. I would therefore propose that we take the following steps. <coughs> These to me would be reasonable. First, that we sh should grant a rule, if necessary, to allow us to begin general debate next week, and that we proceed with it for three or four days beginning next Tuesday. Second, that we have the sponsors submit their final technical amendments to us by or before next Tuesday, at which time we could vote a rule and include the text of those substitutes we agreed to make an order in our report on the rule. And third, that we have the appropriate staff of this House, and this is critical. It's critical to all of us, each member and to the American people, that we have the appropriate staff of this House incorporate, in cooperation with the sponsors of each substitute, prepare a concise, unbiased explanation. And you know, we all uh, tend to exaggerate our own positions. I mean, we feel so strongly about it. And that's, that's understandable. That's human nature. But we need to have a staff prepare an unbiased, concise explanation of each substitute so that it would be easily understood by the average American and by the press and by the journalists that are going to have to dissect this and tell the truth without, without these exaggerations. And uh, those summaries would be compiled in a single house report that would be available through the government printing office. And, Mr. Chairman, fourth, that the second rule we grant provide that after we complete general debate on the bill, we will not proceed to consider the amendments until after the August work period. I say that, Mr. Chairman, because I think something as important and as monumental as national health care legislation is something we should not proceed to enact until we have had the opportunity to go back to our districts to discuss it in detail, the various health care plans, after all, district work period, that's what that's for. We're to go back and to consult with the people that we represent and to rush to judgment on this major program before we've had that opportunity with the American people back in our districts would, in my opinion, be a derelict of duty. We should not do that. So, Mr. Chairman, having said all that, uh, let's get on with the hearing. Well, I think the gentleman makes some very valid suggestions, but as far as scheduling, uh, the matter of the floor, as I said yesterday, that's above our pay grade. So someone else does that. Well, Mr. Chairman, you are one of the most uh, influential uh, uh, members of this body, and I like to think that I am on my side of the aisle. Let's you and I go together to both our leaderships, and I'll bet we can accomplish that. I don't know who they distrust the most. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Derrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I want to commend the chairman on uh, getting all of these in the uh, in, in, uh, uh, printed and distributed to the uh, members today through the congressional record. Uh, but you know, to say that this is the first opportunity that we're going to have to deal with health care, as I recall, if I recall my history correct, correct, I think Theodore Roosevelt was the first that mentioned some uh, national health care, and certainly uh, over the years, Republicans uh, and Democratic presidents, uh, Truman, uh, FDR, Nixon, 
uh, and others have suggested that it would be a step in the right direction. This is, you know, a, a very historic moment. We are, are here, we are the only industrialized nation in the world, major industrialized nation in the world that does not have some form of health care. The problem is not that we don't have the finest health care in the world. The problem is that if you're rich, you can afford it. If you're poor, there's probably a program that will take care of you. But it is the middle income people in this country uh, who are having to pay the load in two different ways. One, they're having to pay the premiums and, and pay for the expenses of those who don't have insurance. But the other is that they're having to pay in a loss of jobs because of a loss of competition that we face around the world because our health care costs are 30 to 40 percent higher than uh, uh, many of our competitors. Uh, I don't have any objection to some of the scheduling that uh, Mr. Solomon has mentioned just a, a few minutes ago, but you know, uh, if not now, when? If not now, if we don't deal with health care now, when are we going to deal with it? We can put it off and put it off. It's been put off for 50 years. We're, we're, we're way too late on it now. I say let's, let's move ahead. We are having some difficulty in, in getting the, uh, the figures, as, as, as everyone knows, the cost uh, estimates. But uh, hopefully the uh, CBO has finished up with the Senate, I think, yesterday. And we'll have a little more information on that later on today. But uh, let's move ahead. The American people want it. The American people need it. And, uh, and our country needs it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for your input. And I thank Mr. Solomon for his input and Mr. Derry. Some questioned in my mind whether the American people really want this health care reform as presented by the administration and some of the other substitutes. I feel strongly that my constituents do not want to see the program federalized. We don't want it lead, to lead into a socialistic system. And goodness knows, this country of ours was built on a free enterprise system, freedom of choice, freedom of support, make the right decision. And we don't want to see the National Health Board tie a string around the necks of the American people and treat the American people like cattle, telling them that they have to use a certain doctor or a certain hospital. They can't use their own physician. They can't use their own hospital. They're regimented beyond belief, and I hope that these measures in finality will not contain such an ingredient. Think about it. We must not let our system follow the Canadian pattern or the English pattern, which leads to socialism, in fact, is socialism. Why can't we let the several thousand health providers get down to the nitty gritty and work out a program that America can live with and then do the necessary to provide health care reform for all the people. We can do it if we try. We've demonstrated in the past that this country has come through many crises, through many wars, and if we set our heads to it, we can do that. I'm the first to admit we need some kind of health care reform. The American people want some type of health care reform. But my constituents do not want a rope tied around their neck telling them what they have to do without freedom of choice. I know <clears throat> what it would mean. In March uh, a year ago, I had five heart bass surgery, and I uh, was offered the opportunity to go to Bethesda. I chose to go back home to the local hospital where they have an outstanding heart facility and had my bypasses. But under such a plan, now forget Jimmy Quill, but under such a plan, if any individual in America wanted to have bypass surgery, where would they go? Tony. 
Would they have the freedom of choice or be regimented like cattle and say, you have to use this hospital, you have to use this physician? And I don't want that to occur in America. I still want the freedom of choice. Take a handicapped child born without any opportunity in the world. Suppose they're diagnosed under any health care reform package. And they say, well, if we spend all these thousands or million dollars on this baby, this youngster, we can't get him well, so we're going to stop care. What are we leading to in America if this should occur? We don't want it to occur, and we must not let it occur. I haven't read these thousands of pages. I don't think anyone in this room has read them. But opening the dialogue, I don't object to, but I've always operated under the presumption that haste makes ways. There's flip-flopping going on, even from the White House to the Senate and to the House of Representatives. The First Lady says she doesn't like the Senator Mitchell's version, or at least it was reported so in the press. <laughs> But she's more favorable to the Gephardt proposal. Can't get her act together. That's the situation we're in. And I agree with Mr. Solomon. Let's go back home, as I have each weekend, and see what our people think. And let's don't cram anything down their throats that we'll regret later on. Be it 2000, be it 1980, 1999, be it whatever it is. Health care reform should be uppermost in our minds, but let's don't deviate from the American system. Let's carry out our goals founded by our founding fathers and do the right thing at the right time, and it's a good time to start. I'm, I'm hesitant for anyone to say we're not going to give you the recess until you pass a health care reform bill. I had a call this morning on the crime bill from a lady back in my district, left a message on my desk, that if you don't vote for the crime bill, I'll campaign against you. I don't cowtail to threats. And I don't like that. I think the American people don't like that either. So let's bow our backs, do whatever is necessary for the benefit of the health care of our people and make health care available under a reasonable basis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Mr. Balenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Didn't know we'd have a chance to make opening statements, but I'll be happy to contribute my, I hope, very very brief one. I'm, I commend the committee for starting work on this most important matter. I'm glad we're we're finally getting it to a to a position where we're able to start forcing some action on it. We all have been, although we're not. The bills that are before us and the substitutes that will be before us are new to a certain extent, uh, because members of leadership, particularly on both sides, has had to go out and try to forge some kind of consensus on on some kind of bills. Things keep changing, keep moving, and we under we understand that, but. The truth of the matter, the fact of the matter, of course, is that we've all been talking about this now for at least a year, year and a half, and we have some understanding, I hope, most members, of what we're, what we're facing, what we're talking about. I continue to give the administration all the credit in the world for forcing this issue, whether or not one agrees with their particular proposals. Those, of course, have been radically changed, but I think it's terribly important and good that the American people, the American Congress, are dealing with this issue, finally, after many decades, really, of keep shunning it aside, even though all of us know that it's something that we should have been dealing with. And I'm, the truth of the matter is all of us, as all of us legislators know, is that until you're forced to start acting and voting on some alternatives, you keep putting it off. You, you keep hoping that there's something else will happen to delay the, the time when you have to make a decision. So we're being forced now to confront specific pieces of legislation, and uh, it's good that we're doing so. There's all the time in the world still, if we don't like what we come up with, 
uh, if we can't pass bills or if we get bills out of both houses that are quite different, we get to conference committee, we can't meld them together in some sensible way that we can back off and come back again next year. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope we're able to work our way through this in the next couple of months and come up with something that the, the great majority of us and our folks back home whom we represent uh, think will be will make a real difference. The fact remains that we face huge problems with respect to health care in this, in this country, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the one hand, close to 40 million people don't have coverage. Another couple of million Americans every month uh, on average lose their coverage as they change or lose their jobs and aren't assured of getting it again immediately. We're the only industrialized nation in the entire world that doesn't have comprehensive coverage, universal coverage. So that's important to all of us, although how we get there, of course, is also important. But the other, the other side of the coin, which unfortunately, and for political reasons, in my opinion, none, none of the bills from either side uh, is addressing quite strongly enough, partly because we don't quite know how to do it, and partly, as I just suggested, because politically it's difficult to do, is the question of holding down costs. We now spend close to 14.5% of our gross national product on, on health care in this country, Mr. Chairman. No other industrialized country spends more than 10%. More than 12, 15 years ago, the average family of four was paying about $800 a year to, to pay for insurance to cover itself. Now that family pays about $5,500. Small businesses aren't able often to afford to pay for coverage for their uh, employees. And all of us as federal taxpayers, as, as we all know all too well, are faced with uh, more than anything else uh, with respect to our budget deficit problem. We're faced with, a, with the question of how we keep health costs under control. Virtually all the other areas of federal spending are now under control, I think it's fair to say, Mr. Chairman. But health care costs aren't. And the two big federally funded health care programs, Medicare and Medicaid, are projected now to, to triple again in cost in the next 10, 12 years. So I'm not sure any of these bills quite do enough with respect to controlling costs, but that's something that we've got to deal with seriously and successfully somehow in the, in the very near future. So I salute our friends from the various committees who are here today with their alternatives. Obviously, it's a difficult situation. Obviously, there's nothing we can come up with which will please everybody, just as obviously something needs to be done. And if we carefully work our way through this morass of conflicting proposals in the next few weeks, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that we can come up with something which we'll, we'll be proud of and which won't be perfect, but which can be perfected over the next half dozen or so years as we have some experience with which what, we, what portions of what we, we, we end up doing this year work and which things don't make so much sense. We'll have time to pull back and change course and, and fix things up as we go along. But we'll, it's important to make a start, and I'm glad finally in this committee we're able to do that. Thank you, Mr. Billinson. Mr. Portagos, opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I agree we're embarking here on, on something of great magnitude, and um, I think we've got uh, clearly uh, our chore cut out in front of us. Uh, this, uh, however many hundreds or thousands of pages it is, I notice a lot of it's in small print, which is tough for old eyes to read. And uh, frankly, a lot of it's not very exciting reading, and I don't mean any disrespect to the authors, but it's pretty dry stuff. And it also has got a lot of uh, minefields and hidden traps in it and things that might be interpreted one way or the other. And it's going to take a fair amount of time to understand all this and understand the consequences. Uh, and I think that part of our job here is going to make certain that we not only know what we think we're getting, but we have a pretty good idea of what we're heading off. Uh, because I, I know that every legislator worries about unintended negative consequences. And when, when you're dealing with a subject this vast, uh, there's much opportunity for things to go wrong. Inevitably, things will go wrong, and we will have some unintended negative uh, consequences. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't get on with our work. And I believe we should. I very much uh, associate myself with uh, Mr. Solomon's comments about being deliberative in this. Uh, and I want to make a very strong distinction. Being deliberative is not being dilatory. And anybody who, who uh, suggests that I am making these remarks because uh, I feel that delay is important or something that couldn't misconstrue my meaning uh, more. Uh, I believe an informed decision is vital uh, in this when we finally get to the time to vote, whenever that may be. Uh, I think every member is going to have to have an opportunity to understand it understand the choices they have out there. I think we all know it's a big deal, but uh, I'm not sure everybody understands the intricacies and the ins and outs of some of these policies. Uh, I think that it's also important that the American public have an opportunity to digest some of the choices that are out there. Lord knows uh, there's been a great deal of spin and uh, discussion and propaganda and advertising and commercial and uh, floor speeching and anything else you want to hear 
uh, it's almost astonishing uh, to me that the AARP uh, has, I heard on NR, uh, national radio this morning, uh, has endorsed a plan that I haven't even seen yet, uh, and in fact didn't get, and yet somehow or other they've uh, digested uh, a couple of thousand pages of small print and uh, have given it the imprimatur. I guess they've been able to canvass their membership and uh, uh, tepid, sorry, tepid endorsement. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what tepid means either. Uh, the long and the short of it is that uh, I know people will smile when I say this, but uh, I think that this should not be about politics. It should be about coming up with decent legislation. And uh, I realize that, uh, that there's no such thing as legislation without politics. But if politics predominate, we are not going to come up with a very good product. Uh, and I think that the only way we can guarantee that we do is if members truly understand what they're going to be asked to vote on after they've read the small print. Uh, that's what we're talking about, reading the small print uh, in this case. Um, I guess that uh, I think we should begin the general debate. And in terms of a specific, I would like to suggest, Mr. Chairman, um, that we, we do think in terms of uh, coming up with a part one rule uh, so that we can um, uh, agree to the general de the parameters of the general debate uh, and then eventually as we I guess it's been tentatively planned anyway to come up with a part two rule to deal with the uh, the amendments. Uh, I, I think that's business that we might be able to actually accomplish this week and I would like to be able to go home if all of the um, rumors are in fact only rumors. Uh, I would like to be able to go home for the working weekend this weekend having uh, understood what the exact rules for the general debate would be next week. And I think a lot of members would. That's assuming we get that far. And I don't think, uh, if as long as the schedule holds the way it's been presented to us so far, that that is uh, an untoward suggestion. Uh, and in fact, I think it would be beneficial because it would at least begin to set out the time blocks and, and allow the, the uh, managers the opportunity to figure out how much time, what committees, uh, what ranking members, what chairman, uh, which members have the expertise and so forth. This is, a, this is a big management task to let members understand this uh, and then have the opportunity to try and persuade other members on these points. Uh, I think that's the kind of rule we need to carve out. Um, I am certainly not suggesting that we rush into any kind of decision or force anybody in any decision before vacation time because I agree we should take uh, after uh, some general debate, we should take the proposals back to the American public and our constituencies uh, and deal with them eyeball to eyeball. I, I find that a telephone call to my office is very nice, but somehow there's a different flavor when you're in a room full of people back in your district, uh, sitting there on a first-name basis with them and uh, getting what their real feelings are. Uh, it, it gives you a somewhat different view uh, than perhaps some of those faxes or uh, onslaughts of pre-printed postcards that we get in our office. And I think that's an opportunity that I would welcome, and I suspect many other members who are going to try and come to an informed decision on this would welcome as well. So I thank you for the opportunity to make these comments, and I, I am relying heavily, again, on your sense of comedy and fairness, which you have shown since I have been on this committee, to make sure we come up with good, fair rules. Thank you. Uh, one thing that disturbs me about your statement is you complain about the small print in the old eyes, and yet the AARP came out and endorsed it. So. I wonder how old your eyes really are. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's a secret. <laughs> and I think Mr. Quillen sees a lot better than I do, Mr. Looking Chairman. At me. Uh, Mr. Frost of Texas. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm sorry that I had to miss some of the opening statements. Uh, I do think that it is very important that we proceed in an orderly but uh, reasonably yeah. swift manner. Um, this uh, legislation has been uh, subject to great debate for 18 months now. And uh, I will be anx anxious to hear the testimony of the uh, witnesses that we have. Uh, I think we know what the major issues are, what the major controversies are involving health care. And I think it is up to this committee to, uh, to move through this testimony uh, quickly and to uh, be able to present, package this matter uh, for the floor so that we can get on to, uh, to a consideration of it. And uh, I would only observe that in my own district there are 130,000 people out of 566,000 who uh, do not have health insurance. And when I walk around and talk to the people that I represent, their biggest concern is that Congress is going to do nothing. They may not agree with everything that the President's proposed, and they may not agree with everything that uh, is in the Gephardt bill or the Mitchell bill, but they're concerned that we are going to fail to act. 
Uh, they're concerned about pre-existing conditions. Uh, they're concerned about uh, guaranteed access to insurance, uh, portability. They're concerned about uh, uh, the cost of insurance, the availability of insurance. There are legitimate concerns that the American public have. And uh, for us to, uh, uh, to head down a road where, which leads, in, uh, leads to total inaction, I think, would be a mistake. Uh, the uh, young you, lady Mr. from Chair. Rochester, New York. Thank you, and I, I appreciate my colleague from Texas being brief, because sometimes I sit here and get older and older and older before you ever get around to me. Um, this is an issue that uh, is very important uh, in my former life. I was a microbiologist with a master's in public health. Um, and so I've been very much concerned about the state of the health in the United States. And I, I, what troubles me most about this debate is that everybody seems to have totally forgotten why we started it. And that was that the cost of health care was rising so enormously that industry and government had said something simply had to be done. Doing nothing was not an option in those days. Um, and I, uh, I know that uh, since that message has gotten lost, it's going to come as a great surprise to people if nothing is done that a lot of industries are probably not going to continue to carry health insurance for their employees and then there is going to be a great cry in the land when they find that people finally have to carry that by themselves or do without. I feel particularly blessed because I live in an area that's had community rating for 40 years. Uh, we owe an awful lot where I come from to people who started planning for health care in 1929. And over these 40 years, uh, we've insured all, all but 6% of our residents. Our premiums are two-thirds of the national average. And uh, we have a 90% utilization of our hospital beds, which saves a great deal of money. And they've decided they've gone beyond this bill in Rochester. We're going to go to universal coverage right now and do away with pre-existing conditions, which have never been as much a problem for us. Uh, if you had a child born with uh, asthma, defective hearts, well, they were covered in Rochester from the beginning. And I had great hopes that the whole country was going to have what we have, which is really what I'd like to see happen. Uh, but it's gotten so far away, and, and when I hear people talking about going home and having another debate with the public, I don't know how, how that's, that's not possible anymore. Because... Uh, the fact that over a billion dollars, I think, has been spent to put out false information. And there are people, even in my district, that have bought in with this one mail order man that if they went to the wrong doctor, they would go to prison for 15 years, and that we intend in this bill to suspend all civil rights after one year. I read that the, uh, I think it was the NFIB spent $43 million on this. Now, I don't know whether the NFIB got $43 million to spend on it, but that's according to ABC the other night on Nightline. There's been more misinformation and more scare tactics on this that I've seen since we, the budget last year, which was going to put us all out on the street selling apples. Uh, I, I'm very troubled by the fact that, um, and I think people don't understand what trouble awaits them if we don't do something. And I'm very troubled by the fact that we, uh, we have delayed this so long. But it would be a humiliation of the greatest type for the United States to be the only industrial country on the planet that can't deal with health care for the people who live here. And I'm proud of the people who've been writing these bills under great duress and all the... the we've had to swim through all this business on... Uh, you know, socialized medicine. I've got, I've got people who are in the 70s telling me they don't want government insurance. I don't dare ask them if that means they don't care for their Medicare because they don't, apparently have not made that connection. But at any rate, it's, uh, it's high time that we did this. I think this first started in Congress in 1914. And uh, I don't know how much more we can say or how much more we can do because as I want to say one more time, we started this because going on as we are is simply no option. Thank you. I thank the lady from Rochester. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call to the table the Honorable Sam Gibbons, Chairman of Ways and Means Committee. And Mr. Gibbons, do you want to be joined by Mr. Pete Stark, Chairman of the Subcommittee? Thank you, Mr. Stark, for coming up here. He's telling me he's got a little statement he wants to make. And I would ask that when I get through, you give him that opportunity because uh, I don't know anyone in Congress who has spent more time and given more talent to working on this subject than has Congressman Stark. Uh, 
uh, the basic legislation that you have before you, you'll probably send to the floor. You started in his subcommittee. It started years ago. Uh, he had intensive hearings on it, invited lots of witnesses, heard lots of people, and finally put it all together and made a lot of decisions. And technically, the bill that's before you today is H.R. 3600. That was reported from the Ways and Means Committee on June the 30th of this year. And so it's been here all of that time, and copies of it have been available, and people really wanted to read it. It was there. Uh, we've made copies available to everybody, not only the exp exp explanative language, but also the technical language. So it's been all there. And, and when we listen to people who say we shouldn't hurry this, uh, I think uh, Mr. Chairman, if you turn on your mic, I think C-SPAN right, might be an easy Well, that's to good. Well, which way do you turn it on? Just sure. like that? Fine. Okay. Under where it says Plan A. Plan A. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, you know, this is... Uh, <laughs> you want to see all those nice things about me well, over again? Yeah, well, <laughs> all right. Good. Well, I always uh, enjoy looking at something that was made in the Netherlands. I happened to liberate that plant about 50 years ago. Uh, and... Uh, so it's nice to have this Phillips, uh, uh, which is from Eindhoven in the Netherlands, uh, uh, here in front of me. Uh, when, when I hear people complain that we haven't had enough time, I say, oh my Lord, how much time do we need? Mr. Pepper's picture is over there. He was chairman of this committee. In 1950, in Florida, he uh, was defeated in an election because he supported the... Uh, the plan that had been put forward by uh, President Truman at that time. This debate has been raging in this country for over 44 years. Uh, President Truman came forward with a proposal in, in the 1940s, and the Pepper uh, Smathers election was really waged over that one issue. It was waged all over Florida and practically all over the nation. As I say, uh, then Senator Pepper was defeated by Congressman Smathers over this one issue. And, uh, you know, uh, that's just how long this has been a raging issue in this country. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm amused at Mr. Quillen wanting, or somebody wanting to take this home and, and have, a, have a public hearing on it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let me tell you, you will get more special interest at that hearing than you've ever attracted at any he hearing in your life. And they will all have their positions. And uh, you can learn just as much about this program, uh, taking the common sense that you were born with and sitting down and reading this and applying that to it as you can form a stormy uh, uh, two or three hour public hearing in your own district on this. Uh, and uh, if you need any further explanation of that, I'll be happy to give it to you. Uh, what we're talking about today is uh, how you will organize this debate so that the American public will get the best understanding and the American people will get the best understanding of what we have before us. I think the American public should recognize that in the last 20 years that health care costs have escalated at such a rate in the United States that we are stealing from other parts of our economy and our society money to put in the health care program. About 20 years ago, health care and education were about the same. If you take all the education in the United States from cradle, from kindergarten through doctorate level, it amounts to about 7% of our gross domestic product. It has been roughly that during most of the post-World War II era. Healthcare 20 years ago was also about 7% of our gross domestic product. But healthcare had an appetite that just ran away with it and no kind of cost containment in it. And now healthcare is twice as much as education. We're spending twice as much on education, probably going to maybe three times as much as education. And so I don't know where 
out of the pie all of this food is going, but it looks like to me that most of it is going to health care and other parts of the American pie, such as education, are being shortchanged. It may be in, in our ability to control crime. It may be in some other area of our society, but health care has just run away with all of it, and there's really no reason for it. It hasn't run away in other countries, other industrialized countries, but it has in ours. So one of the things that we attempt to accomplish in the program, the proposal has been put forward uh, from the Ways and Means Committee and has been adopted by Mr. Gephardt as a basis for his substitute, is, is cost containment. And I think we do a good job in that without the drastic cost controls. Now, another complaint that I hear and heard from, heard from Mr. Quillian a while ago is that there's no choice in this. Well, really, if he were accurate, there's no choice in America today. Most people get whatever health care program their employer says they can have. And there's no choice in that. And what Americans are complaining about is that most employers have required their employees to set, accept a managed care type of health care program. That means that uh, those employees and their families, when they go uh, to try to choose their own doctor, really have no choice. They've got to get the plan that their employer gave them. Well, in the Gephardt proposal that comes out of the Ways and Means Committee, we give every American at least two choices. They can get a managed care program, which is what they have to swallow now, or they can get a fee-for-service program like Mr. Quillian was able to select because of the program that he and the rest of us are under here in Congress. So we guarantee more choice than the average American has today. And we want to make sure that the average American can, if they're willing to pay for it, have their own doctor, have their own hospital, spend as much money as they want to on their own health. That's a choice that they could make. But we want to make sure that every American has an opportunity to be covered. So that's, a, that's essentially what the program does. It comes forward here for you. Uh, technically speaking, there are two provisions of all of these bills that I am worried about, or two titles. The two titles are Title II and Title XI of the Gephardt Substitute. They're tax matters. They're written in the Internal Revenue Code. I would caution you all to be very cautious about granting amendments into those provisions. Now, they could have all kind of unintended results and all kind of cost if, they, if you allow people to go into those two titles. Now, I recognize that where you're going to have complete substitutes, that that plea is perhaps not able to, to be followed. But uh, if, if, if you do grant uh, any access into those two titles, be very, very careful what you do, or we could end up with a real economic uh, uh, mess on our hands if you allow everybody to go in and amend the Internal Revenue Code. So Titles two and Title XI are just a little bit sacred in this whole debate. I. Uh, would like to turn to Mr. Stark now, who has some other views on, on this. And as I said uh, in my opening remarks, I don't think I can pay enough uh, tribute to him because I don't know of any man in Congress who spent more time and more effort and has a greater ability to understand it all than Mr. Stark. And he's done a yeoman's job, and so I'd like to turn part Mr. of Mr. Stark, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just um, wanted to suggest briefly, um, some of you alluded to the history of health care, and I've at least read back as far as Medicare. I read Mr. Quillen's statement uh, in 1964 or 65. He's improved on it since then, but we still uh, have the same difference, and I think we can almost stipulate to our political difference. Uh, my good friends to the chair's right, uh, I think, feel as a, as a political philosophy that uh, Government is something from which the populace must be protected. They, must, they feel that government can intrude on our lives too much. And I think if you had to describe a difference between the parties, I think that 
those of us on the other side of the aisle to take the contrary position, think that government can be an effective and useful force to create a better society. And I've always felt that that perhaps defines our difference. It did in 1964 when we debated Medicare. Uh, we prevailed. I think we were right. And I think that will be the political discussion that will is going on now in the other body and we will have here. Should we decide and should the Democrats prevail that government will do something? Pass a law, call it a mandate if you choose, uh, direct people to have insurance, control costs, do all of those things that are in H.R. 3600. We are embarking on what is indeed, as Chairman Gibbons has suggested, a, a complex matter and can affect uh, hospitals, physicians, pharmaceutical companies, seniors, juniors, uh, uh, pediatric care. It can affect the poor, it can affect the rich, it can affect the economy, small business, big business. It is instricably tied together. And my one plea was addressed by Chairman Moakley earlier to suggest that he would hold this hearing open for subsequent amendments. I would merely ask that as you do that, uh, that and I don't mean for a moment to criticize either the majority leader's effort or the efforts of those who have put together substitutes, but to urge you to avoid potentially embarrassing problems, that you allow amendments that would strike uh, provisions that have not been considered by any committee of jurisdiction, um, if in fact they would reduce the costs to the bill, because there will be many amendments offered in good faith that will either increase costs or have unintended consequences. And that you consider looking at those amendments carefully, and that also you consider adding non-cost amendments that will come to you from the many committees of jurisdiction, and that they may have an opportunity. Because many committees, besides the Ways and Means Committee, have deliberated and labored in good faith and would like to add portions to the bill. So that I think, Chairman Moakley, your suggestion early on that you would consider other amendments later is a, is a wise one. Uh, I would urge you to consider them with the budget scoring, which will be necessary and we don't yet have. And that was my plea today. Uh, you've already preempted it, but I wanted to come and hear Sam t say all those nice things about me, so I couldn't skip that. And I'd, um, that concludes my statement, and I wish you uh, all the best in your deliberations as you try and uh, create an orderly process for us to debate this on the floor. Thank you. Just very briefly, let me make it clear. I'm here supporting the Gephardt substitute for 3600, and I think it's well thought out, well worked out. Uh, and uh, I think it ought to be considered. All right. Uh, I, I thank you, gentlemen. I know how hot both of you have labored. Uh, <coughs> talking. I remember talking to Congressman Stark about two years ago on some of the uh, things that uh, needed to be cleared up as far as doctors and uh, outside hospital activities were concerned. Uh, and in fact, when I, I looked at an old piece of uh, election paraphernalia that I had, my first, uh, when I first elected the Congress, one of the things was, I want to get down to Washington to help Senator Kennedy pass a health bill. Now, that was 1972. I know that some things can't be hurried, but I mean, we'll be looking more into old age diseases than anything else if we keep waiting on this bill. So. Uh, something has to be done uh, because the costs cost are spiraling. Uh, if this uh, cost isn't uh, brought under control, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will be paying $2,400,000 more to, uh, in uh, the year 2000 than they are today for medical care. And that's just one state. Mr. Billinson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just, just one brief question, if I may. Um, I alluded to this in my, in my opening remarks. The, the questions of cost control are obviously difficult politically, because when you start talking about these things, people start getting their hackles up a little bit. But it is one of the driving forces here, one of the driving problems. Is it your opinion, either of you gentlemen, that, that, that uh, Mr. Gephardt's bill in its current form will be successful in that regard? 
I take it part of the answer is that as one moves toward universal coverage, that that's a necessary part of controlling costs, because we continue to have cost shifting if we don't do that. Um, and beyond that, I guess we have to tread kind of carefully, because there's not enough support out there from either party at the moment, I suppose, to do things that may end up being necessary. Do we, I, I take it also, and this is kind of a leading question, but it's meant to be, uh, do we assume and hope that uh, the competition engendered by the, by the system that the bill envisages is what will keep costs a good deal lower in the future than they have been in recent years? proposal coming out of the Ways and Means Committee, which is intact in the Gephardt proposal, uh, really based upon two, two provisions. One is that competition will finally begin to work. It hadn't worked in the current system because there were too many different ways to present the product to the public. Uh, because of the way we set it up in the bill, there will be competition on price, there will be competition on service, but there won't be all kind of competitions on all kind of uh, unusual things like exclusions and inclusions and things like that. There will be a basic benefit package that every insurance company can compete on. And in terms of price, on, in terms of price and quality, on the and, basis of right. price, and then you can buy anything other over that that you want, so that the price system will finally begin to work on the fundamental coverage that we have. We give plenty of time for that kind of competition and for managed competition to come in and begin to control these costs. And then in the year 2001, if those haven't worked, other procedures will come in. Uh, and those other procedures will have effective cost containment in them, but they will be government procedures. We delay the government procedures and only bring them in as a last resort after plenty of deliberations, after there's been plenty of time for the cost containment that is fundamentally built in uh, through the competition method to work. One, one quick follow-up question, and then I'll be through, Mr. Chairman, at this point with these two gentlemen. I, and I take it, at least from what you just said, Sam, and from what we know of the bill, the answer to this is probably yes anyway. But for those of us who do believe, even those of us on this side and perhaps some on the other side who want very much for us to act now, uh, but who still are worried about moving too quickly or too far or too fast or biting off more than we can chew, that is, those of us who want to be careful and cautious and cautious but move and start grappling, coming to grips with this issue, I take it that the, the bill you all are supporting uh, like by its very nature, by the fact that some of its provisions don't even take effect, perhaps at all, or certainly for a number of years, would, in effect, you would argue, uh, give us some time to, to make some adjustments to change course and change direction over the next two, three, four years, if necessary, if, if uh, what we hope uh, the bill would provide does not, in fact, uh, take effect and doesn't, doesn't pan out. Yes. When, when the bill came out of the Ways and Means Committee, it had a final effective date in on January 1, 1998, Mr. Gephardt, in his wisdom, said, well, that's, let's take a little more time to phase it in so it really becomes effective in January 1, 1999. So we've got uh, five years <laughs> before it really becomes effective. And the cost containments in it don't become effective until later than that because we give the cost containment that is built in through the competitive system a chance to work and to prove itself, and I think it will prove itself as far as cost containment is concerned. Essentially, all that we're trying to do, Mr. Bielinson, is to bring down medical care cost inflation from the medical rate, which is about three times as high as the normal rate, down close to the normal rate. If we don't do that, uh, that means that, that, that medical care will, 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 is already twice as high in this country as it is in most industrial countries. If we don't get some cost containment in the medical inflation, we're going to be in serious, serious economic and competitive uh, position uh, as far as the rest of the world is concerned. It's going to come out substantially out of the cost of uh, out of the standard of living of Americans if we don't get that under control. May I ask for an addendum? Absolutely. Just, just, a, just a one follow-up to this question, then Feel I'll you through with this. Thanks. Again, to, to make the same point another way, perhaps. 
even those, again, those of us, many of us who, who want some change or want to do something, have been concerned from the beginning that we not just leap in and change the whole method by which by which medicine is, is delivered, health care is delivered in this country so that next year everything is topsy-turvy and we all have to deal with an entirely different system. That's not what's envisioned here. That's no. not what would happen. In effect, Absolutely. in effect, am I correct in understanding or believing that what we're doing to a certain extent is, is encouraging or molding or helping along changes which in fact are already occurring in the delivery of health care in this country, trying to make them at the same time more competitive, trying to iron out some problems and some inefficiencies which, and some unfairnesses which exist, but in fact not making any very radical changes at all, other than perhaps to, to quicken the pace of change which is, which is out there anyhow. Is that a fair way of understanding that's, that's what's happening? That's a very fair way of explaining it. The system we've got now really came out of wage price controls in World War II. The Congress had to impose wage price controls. As a result of that, we got fringe benefits. The most popular and lasting fringe benefit was health care. Uh, it wasn't designed by anybody. It came about by accident, and it has developed to where now 70 percent of all Americans get their health care through an, an insurance uh, provided by their employer. And we're building on that system, trying to bring it to its logical conclusion and make it effective and make it effective not only for the de de delivery of benefits, but to make it effective for the delivery of cost containment, which it has lacked up to now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, my Chairman. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> well, Mr. Uh, Chairman, let me uh, also uh, heap uh, the appropriate accolades on these two gentlemen. They, uh, they both are highly respected uh, for their astuteness uh, and their perseverance and, and work ethic. Uh, uh, when we talk about astuteness, I happen to like the astuteness of Mr. Stark better when it comes to trade issues, uh, especially <laughs> most favorite nation trade with China. Uh, but, uh, but they both are highly respected. Let me just, first of all, ask you, Sam, uh, when do you think we will actually cast the key votes on, uh, on these, these issues on the, on the floor of the House? Sometimes this year. Sometimes this year, uh, I, you know, the, we have to set timetables or we never get anything accomplished. And of course, the leadership has tried to say that we would be voting on this very seriously by this time next week. I, I hope we can. I'm not sure that we can, but I hope we can, and I'll do all I can to to speed that up. Obviously, after that. Uh, Hopefully there will be a conference with the Senate, and it would look like to me that early in October we may have, have to be ready to, to uh, receive a conference report and deliberate on it. Well, the reason uh, I mentioned, uh, I know I've heard your, your feelings about the, uh, the town meetings back home and Mrs. Slaughter's, uh, uh, I, I really do disagree. I, when I hold my town meetings, I don't, uh, I don't seem to get all these special interest groups. I just get people. And um, I know I held one uh, not too long ago in Saratoga Springs, New York, which is sort of in the center of my 270-mile-long district. Mm -hmm. And I had people come from 150 miles away to Saratoga uh, to ask me what I thought was happening on the, on the health care plans. And uh, it was very difficult to do that because these plans uh, – as you know, have changed. Sure. Uh, I can understand the gentleman's concern. But um, uh, I happened to run into uh, a member of the Democrat Whip organization coming out of your Whip meeting this morning, as I was going to the Republican conference and uh, to tell them what I thought was going to happen with these rules here. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, or whether <coughs> that person, said that uh, Mr. Gephardt might have an announcement this afternoon where we might. Uh, all go home for a few days subject to the call of the chairs after tomorrow afternoon. And I just, uh, that of course uh, would give us some opportunity to, even though we couldn't have the time to set town meetings, we could at least be able to discuss this uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the press and with the, with the people that uh, ultimately we represent. But let me, let me get beyond that for a minute. You know, there are here nine proposals before us. Uh, the, uh, there are, uh, there is a Democratic proposal, which is now the Gephardt proposal, which is uh, taking the place of, of your final product, I guess, that came out of your committee. Yes, that's right. There is the, uh, the Michael 
proposal, which has now changed some. That's the Republican position at the present time. We also have a single payer plan uh, that has some support there. Uh, and we have the bipartisan plan. And I guess, uh, I guess what we really need to, to determine here before this committee is how we're going to debate all of these proposals. Certainly, there is going to be opposition to having a, uh, a winner take all, or the one that gets the most votes win. I mean, that would be the best way, I mean, as far as, you know, the, the, the American people are concerned, but I doubt very much if, if we're going to see that happen. You know, there's probably going to be some King of the Hill uh, arrangement, which I very much would object to, because uh, a, a substitute getting fewer votes could actually prevail uh, than one that got a substantial uh, uh, majority of the vote, and I don't think that's right. But I guess my question to you is, we have the Democrat position, we have a Republican position, we have the bipartisan position, and it would seem to me that if we, if we want to talk bipartisanship, that we would take that bipartisan substitute here, which is, as you, you uh, admit, credible. I mean, it's, a, it's credible just like yours is. And make that the base text of the bill. And then uh, have the other proposals, whatever this committee sees fit to make in order, uh, have them be uh, alternatives to that base text. That would show bipartisanship, I think, on both sides. It would take away a lot of this partisan picking at each other. And, uh, and at least we would then be able to, uh, to let the American people know that, uh, that we were trying. We were trying to have a, uh, put forth a, a bill. You know, uh, so many of, of my constituents are just, they feel they don't want to threaten the quality of care that they have now. Uh, they don't want to threaten the level of consumer choice that they have, and they don't want to th throw out the system, but they want to fix what's broke, and we could get into that, portability, pre-existing conditions, and, and so forth. But uh, what would you think of that if we had a, uh, had a proposal that would really uh, be bipartisan and would give, uh, give the House an up or down vote on that issue along with your proposals and our proposals? Well, essentially, the bipartisan proposal that you talk about is, is nothing more than insurance reform. And we have insurance reform, probably more stringent insurance reform, in our proposal than they have in theirs. <clears throat> uh, the problem with just trying to do insurance reform is that it doesn't work. It means that insurance becomes more expensive, and then people vote with their pocketbooks and get out of the insurance market. And, and we end up with fewer people covered for health care uh, expenditures than we started out with. That, in your state of New York, is a classic example of just trying insurance reform, which is, I understand, the bipartisan proposal. I, I'm, you're, you're more familiar than I am as to what happened in New York, but the legislature in New York thought they had a perfect insurance reform. They passed it, uh, but uh, they didn't require everybody to participate in it. Then people looked at it and said, you know, uh, insurance reform is going to cost me more money. Uh, I'll just get out of the system. And so you ended up with a smaller and smaller pool of more and more disadvantaged people in it, medically disadvantaged people, and costs just went out of the ceiling. And you've got a, got a real problem, as I understand it, in New York, because they tried what is essentially the bipartisan method here, of just pure insurance reform standing by itself with no mandate that people had to participate in it. Uh, and, and that's why I don't think insurance reform is a good basic document for you all to work from, or for the House to work from. Well, I, uh, I disagree with that, uh, that analysis, and it, it's that kind of intrusion by the state legislature in the state of New York that uh, drove 500,000 uh, jobs across the border into Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, that along with the increased tax structure that we have in yeah. the uh, But uh, let, me, let me just then get into some detail. Uh, uh, the, when I, I mentioned the hearing I had in Saratoga, and... Uh, I was deluged with, uh, with uh, worry from uh, senior citizens about uh, these Medicare Part C uh, proposals. And uh, 
You know, uh, so many of them uh, pointed to the, uh, the original Social Security plan, which, Sam, you know, went into effect. It was a, a supplemental security retirement uh, check, which people would get once a month. And that was the plan back in 1932. And then over the years, and there's that whole litany of things that were added in and the additional trust funds that were created, and, uh, and people point to that, and they, they look at this Medicare Part C, and they, they, become, they really get worried because they depend on Medicare right now, uh, which is a system that needs fixing but is, uh, is a pretty good system. And they are scared to death about, about what we're doing. What are you doing with this Medicare Part C? In your bill. Well, I, well, I, I don't mean to debate the bill here. That's not our job. I, 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 I've talked a lot. Let me let Pete talk. Well, uh, we uh, anticipated that many of your seniors would have a concern with Part C because we designed Part C to be parallel or a mirror of Medicare. But it is isolated from Medicare. So basically it is a separate system. It will not affect Medicare at all. And so for the seniors in your district, as and I do in my district, you can assure them that their Medicare will continue uh, as it has. Uh, Part C will use the same rules uh, and the same type of payment mechanism, um, but it will be a separate, separately funded and uh, not impact on Medicare at all, which, and I agree with the gentleman, it, it was a concern. We anticipated that, and uh, you can assure your seniors, uh, the Medicare will continue, uh, obviously, with your support. <laughs> and and well, Medicare Part you, I, C... I, you will have my support yeah. to continue Medicare. Medicare yes. Part C is not a tax-supported program. It is a premium-supported program, right. and it will be self-sufficient and stand alone. It is really the safety net in which people fall when they... Describe the people. Well, I mean, uh, all right. The, 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 that's a very good question. Basically, the proposal is put forward by the Ways and Means Committee and Mr. Gephardt relies upon a formal employer-employee relationship. There are a lot of people that don't fall into the employer-employee relationship to get their benefits. And so Medicare Part C is designed to be the safety net in which they fall. Obviously, the unemployed are not in an employer-employee relationship. The self-employed are not in an employer-employee relationship. And there are lots of casually employed people who do not fall into the employer-employee relationship. Are you talking about young people, like they would 19, be young, 20 years old? They would be all ages. They would be migratory workers, uh, part-time workers, seasonal workers, agricultural workers, all those kind of people who don't fall into any employer-employee relationship. Some of them got five jobs, and they don't really know who is their employer. They just know they go from one to another, uh, maybe at a different season of the year, a different hour of the day. And those are the, the kind of, they, those, those, are, those are the people, those are the people that will and fall into orchards. Medicare Part C. Uh, it, it, it is a, a group that is difficult to cover in, the, in what we think of the employer-employee relationship. So that's all that that's there for. And we notice that most of those changes take place in small employer-employee relationships. And so small employers that have a rather mobile workforce can either buy private insurance uh, with the standard benefits in it, or they can say, well, I'll just put all my employees in, a, in Medicare Part C and quit worrying about uh, all the paperwork that goes with all this. That's, so that's going to be a special tax? It's, separate it's a from special it, 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 It'll be a special premium that premium? is levied on everybody uh, and will will pay for the cost of the program. Okay. Well, and Mr. Chairman, I hope you just bear with me for sure. a few minutes here. Uh, Sam, you also mentioned uh, you were concerned about Title II and Title uh, XI, I think it was. Yes, there is Deal the with taxes. What, what are those taxes? What, what's, that, uh, what's that all well, about? Well, the taxes are, are not... That's not the premiums we're talking about no, now. Those are the different. taxes are not a significant part of this bill. And every time I hear somebody go out and say, you know, the taxes are just going to eat us up, there is a up to 45 cent cigarette per pack cigarette tax in this bill. Up to 45. It takes five years to get up to 45 cents. Uh, not a very burdensome tax, uh, uh, considering the price of a pack of cigarettes today, 45 cents 
coming in over five years after this bill is effective, a little at a time, it will not uh, make or break this bill or make or break anybody who smokes. Uh, the other tax is a premium tax that is set at the rate of 2% on all health care premiums and all self-insurance premiums, because a lot of businesses self-insure, and we figured we, we had to have some money to fund <coughs> medical education and medical training and medical research, and we'd been funding a lot of these through the Medicare and Medicaid programs, and we're phasing those out and phasing that out. And so those are the only real taxes that we have in this bill, very minor taxes. I, I haven't heard anybody yet complain to me that the 2% premium tax is a burdensome tax. And of course, I heard from all the smokers, just like you all did, uh, about that. But you know, they're insignificant in all of this, and those are the only taxes that are involved in all of this. Well, Mr. Chairman, I've you know I've got a lot of other questions, but I I know there are a lot of people well, waiting to testify. Too long, I'm afraid. No, no. But let me. If it uh, is it possible to submit other questions to you uh, sure. that we might uh, put in Happy this to. record later on, and uh, we might save a lot of the members' may time. I, then. May I put in a commercial here? We've got sure. an operation going down at H two O eight. That if any member, Democrat, Republican, has a question, they can come in there and ask, ask the questions of us and our staff. We are there around the clock uh, to answer questions. And we, we are getting a lot of inquiries from your staff and your letter answers and your LAs and all of that. So come on down. We'd, we'd be happy to take your questions and try to give you the actual answers to them. Well, Sam, thank you for the invitation. And let me extend an invitation to all of you. If we do break in August, you know, August is the racing season in Saratoga. Oldest, most beautiful racetrack in America. Y'all come on up. You'll enjoy I'll it. I'll be home campaigning oh, when we break. You'll never, you'll never make it. You'll never make it because all those people visiting his town hall would be blocking passage to the racetrack. Mr. Frost. I hate to, uh, to vary from the discussion of substance, but I really have a couple of procedural <laughs> questions I would like to pose to, uh, uh, to the chairman. Um, are you, what is your view as to whether we should wait to grant a rule until there is some sort of definitive action from the United States Senate? Could you address that? If, if I were making the decision in the leadership, I would have scheduled us to vote long before the Senate has. Pardon me for, for, for philosophizing here. I have followed the House and the Senate for quite some time. I have never in my lifetime ever seen the Senate take up and pass a controversial piece of legislation first. Never happened. You go back to 19... 35 when the Social Security Act was passed. It started here in the House. You go to 1938 when the when the Fair Labor Standards Act started. It was started here in the House and we had to vote first. You go through every piece of major legislation that has ever become law and it, they all started in the House. Now that's no denigration of the Senate but it's just an explanation of what the facts are. Okay. I don't know why you all understand the Senate as well as I do but major pieces of legislation in order to become law have always started in the House. Well, let, me, let me follow up on that, if I may, then. Um, are you suggesting that as soon as the uh, CBO scoring numbers are available, whenever that magic moment in time is, that the House should immediately proceed to floor consideration of this yes, legislation? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. If, if and those... In fact, you know, you know in all due respect to CBO, they are just skilled estimators. Mm -hmm. Nobody on God's green earth can actually predict down to the type their prediction they're trying to make what human reaction is going to be in all of this. Well, uh, Mr. Uh, so, you should know, you know, I don't want to make myself a slave to CBO. I love their expertise, but let me tell you, in working with them while the Ways and Means Committee was working with this, and they weren't tied up on everybody else's business at that time, we had a terrible time getting the, the estimates from them. Uh, 
they claim, and I believe, they're just overworked. And it's been my experience that all these estimates turn out to be nothing more than estimates, and, and I don't know how much good they really do. Mr. Chairman, is it your view, then, that we should proceed to floor consideration of this legislation next week? Yes. And that this committee should grant a rule in order to make that possible? Absolutely. Let me, uh, let me ask you another, and, and have you, I assume you've communicated that to our leadership. Yes, sir. Because uh, they have not, uh, as uh, I think one of the members on the other side, perhaps Mr. Solomon, indicated that uh, uh, there has not been a clear communication back from our leadership as to what the schedule will be. Uh, the, um, and perhaps we will know that later today. Well, hour by hour, we're getting one thing out of the way at a time. We're right down now to your hour. Mm -hmm. if you all will give us a signal to go to the floor and debate. I think these things will begin to fall in place. I can't predict what the actual outcome will be, but I know you have to set a schedule. That's your job and your, and, and, and well, not schedule, but you, have, you set the matter in which we will debate it, and the leadership has got to set the actual schedule. But my advice to you and my advice to the leadership is let's move ahead. Play ball. Yes. <laughs> it, 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 it is, it, you know, it, I, Look up here at Senator Pepper. Forty-four years ago, this thing was a raging issue in this country. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask you some further procedural questions, um, and you may have indicated this in, in correspondence, or you may have already uh, addressed this, I don't recall. Uh, how much time do you believe that uh, this matter will take on the floor? How much uh, general debate? Uh, how much total, how many days on the floor do you think Well, it will depends be upon how many substitutes you all make available. Some of the substitutes deserve more attention than others, and you're going to have to make the decision as to which substitutes are the most germane and most logical and most sensible to take up in this debate. I would think that about, on general debate, uh, you know, we could take about a day and then take anywhere from a half a day uh, to a quarter of a day for the substitutes, uh, depending upon their significance. And I think that if we did that, by the time we get to Friday night, uh, next week, the 18th or 19th, I've forgotten what date it is, we ought to have uh, made our minds up. Mr. Chairman, let me ask you one other question, if I may. In the, and I, I, I gather from your earlier testimony, you do not believe this is going to happen. But on the odd chance that the United States Senate might cast some decisive votes on this matter uh, sometime in the next few days, perhaps the next week, and if the Senate were to strip from the Mitchell bill any requirement of employer mandates, what would be your view as to what should be presented on the floor uh, of the House of Representatives? In other well, words, I think we ought to go ahead with the proposals we have. Uh, as I say, I respect the Senate. Uh, we will have to meet them in conference. Uh, let's go ahead, do the best we can, and, and meet them in conference. I have ultimate faith that we will be able to work these matters out. Well, I, my, my question really is, if the Senate were to uh, give some sort of definitive signal that they were not going to go forward with any type of employer mandate, um, should there be any amendment offered to your bill or to the Gebhardt bill which would attempt to in any way uh, track what the Senate uh, did? You've got to make up a, uh, your mind as to whether we should have universal coverage and cost containment, or whether we're going to go on with essentially a very inflationary system that has many, many inequalities in it. And I don't see how you can do it. If you essentially, when it gets down to the mandate issue, and mandate is just a scare word that was invented by the publicist to scare everybody to death. I don't know of a law that I have voted on since I've been in Congress. It wasn't a mandate. Can you all think of anything we passed around here that wasn't a mandate? We, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe 200 years ago we should have started calling these things mandates instead of laws. 
But the publicists figured they could scare the American public to death if they started calling laws mandates. I can think of one, Sam. We repealed catastrophic insurance coverage. Remember? Yeah, that yeah was well, that's a different. That was a, that was a real mandate. I don't, I don't, don't know of any. Uh, I don't know of any law that we have really seriously considered. We have some resolutions every now expressing a sense of the House. Miss, uh, uh, but we we never have passed anything but mandates in 220 years. Mr. Chairman, my, my concern uh, as a member of the majority is that if the Senate were if the Senate were to cast any type of uh, decisive vote on this issue and if it were to go the other way that that might you know, that very act might drive the House to pass the bipartisan substitute for your bill and for the Gebhardt bill. And my question is if there would be any attempt at that point to modify the Gebhardt bill uh, to offer an alternative to the bipartisan substitute which is being discussed and which is before this committee because we may find ourselves in a situation where we have limited choices on the floor and that's one of the jobs of this committee is to determine what those choices are. Sure, I recognize that, uh, but I would say don't back up, don't back down. We have a conference in which those kind of decisions can be made. Uh, if, if you're worried about whether or not there are going to be enough votes on the House floor or not, uh, that, that's a political decision. But, but, but legislatively, we ought to do what the House wants to do and, and not pay a heck of a lot of attention to what the other body uh, wants to do uh, and the conference is a place to iron out those differences. Uh, sometimes, uh, and this has been particularly true from your committee, though not just from your committee, the chairman of the committee has asked for a chairman's amendment, uh, the, your predecessor, Mr. Rostenkowski, did that from time to time, to have in his back pocket uh, in the event that uh, some changes need to be made on the floor uh, as the uh, legislative process progresses. And sometimes this committee has even given the chairman a blank check, chairman's amendment. We've not actually seen the amendment, but uh, given him the right to offer an amendment to modify his own bill. Do you anticipate that, would, would you or, or Mr. Uh, Gephardt, no. <laughs> would, uh, would you or Mr. Gephardt uh, be seeking any such authority from this committee to have the right to go in and modify your own bill or the Gephardt bill as this uh, matter progresses? Well, if you want to give me that kind of check, I will assure you that I will use it with a great deal of wisdom and discretion and only after full consultation with my committee and uh, with the leadership here. Uh, but at this time, I'm not asking for that. Uh, but if you think that's a wise way to proceed, I will try to use the power wisely. I tried to, uh, uh, Chairman Mokley, I've tried to limit myself to procedural questions because uh, the substance will be deba debated on the floor. And uh, the, uh, the decisions that this committee will make on procedure are very, very important to the ultimate outcome. Uh, as everyone knows, on this particular bill. And uh, I thank the uh, thank Chairman Gibbons very much thank for his you. testimony. Sam, uh, in answer to uh, Congressman Frost's question, you said that you'd recommend to get to the floor and, and uh, you start working it as soon as possible. Yes, sir. Uh, that's regardless of a vote count? If you didn't know where the votes were, we could still do that? Uh, well, that's my recommendation is we go to the floor. I think, I think People will begin to focus better when it when you when you set a deadline, Mr. Chairman. I have found that that is that causes me to focus. I think it causes other members to focus. I think one of the problems we've suffered from so long here now is that there hasn't been enough focus on all of this. We've we've been looking at too many targets out here all over the place. Once you finally get a document in front of you and you can really discuss it and you can really focus on it. I, I think people begin to make up their minds. So we can start this and, and uh, see what happens. Without the CBO estimates? Even without I, I, Even without them, I would go ahead. Uh, we, we know that when this bill came out of the Ways and Means Committee, and this is essentially the bill that came out of the Ways and Means Committee, that the CBO at that time had scored it, that over a five-year period, it was deficit neutral. In fact, it produced a $2 billion federal deficit reduction over five, the first five years. 
Over the first 10 years that they scored it, it produced better than $20 billion worth of deficit reduction. Now, those wonderful folks over there keep scoring and scoring and scoring these things, and you know, if you wait long enough, you'll finally get a score that you like, depending on what side you're on. So, you know, I think it's been scored enough. I, I don't think that anybody can score it perfectly, and I think we all, it's time to move ahead on the thing. Now, that's not said uh, that I want to move recklessly, but it's been my experience in dealing with the CBO that uh, their, their estimates change. Uh, this, whole, uh, this whole thing of estimating what something's going to cost in the future and trying to anticipate what human reaction is going to be is at its very best a, a, a rather inaccurate science. It, it is only an educated uh, Yes, yes, Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for the good job you do in committee. Thank you. But I'm kindly amazed, uh, Mr. Gibbons, at your testimony. Not that I disagree with you in principle, and I know as chairman of the Ways and Means you have a mandate to bring that bill before the members of this body. But I believe you're ignoring what's in the other substitute. The bipartisan bill, the others. In other words, are you going to stay close to the fur that you're plowing on the Gephardt bill and your bill, and you're not going to consider anything good in the other measure? Well, it, it, the bipartisan bill, and I've looked at it, is, essent is essentially subsumed in ours. We have insurance reform in our proposal, uh, the proposal that Mr. Gephardt has adopted. We've got what I think is more thorough insurance reform than it is in the bipartisan bill. Uh, and insurance reform is important, but in insurance reform just standing alone will cause uh, uh, real serious economic dislocation in, in the whole system. Insurance reform standing alone will mean that insurance cost will go up uh, because you're covering a, a, a lot of people uh, who have been unable to obtain insurance because they were ill, disabled, or for some pre-existing condition or were not connected to the workforce. And if you just have insurance reform, your insurance costs will go up unless you require everybody to participate in it, and that gets down to this horrible word of mandate. Uh, as long as insurance reform is just an optional procedure for everybody to participate in, uh, the well people will opt out, and the unwell people will opt in, and the cost of insurance will go sky high, and you'll end up with fewer people having health care coverage than you do today. That's been the history of this country whenever somebody at the state level just attacked insurance reform. So, you know, I, I have no objection to what's in, the, what's in those uh, bills from the so-called bipartisan bill, but we include all of that in our bill, and, and, and we make it work by saying everybody's got to participate. Well, I won't argue with the provisions you measure, but it seems to me that we should not be so one sided and opinionated because health care is such a massive, massive thing. I'm sure there are other experts in the Congress other than Ways and Means members, but I, I, let me ask you just an elementary question. Are there enough votes to pass the Gephardt bill? Well, I don't know. Well, I hope there will be. <laughs> of course you do. Well, assuming we uh, nobody can nobody are. nobody. I have 220 today. <laughs> so I, I thought they you are. said 120. <laughs> today. Jimmy, in all honesty, nobody can answer that bill. That well, question. but if you don't have a bipartisan approach, I don't think you can, and I don't think that the mandates and your bill, which the Senate doesn't have, the 80 percent versus 50 percent in the Senate and the trigger when it takes effect. Somehow, I think Mr. Frost brought up some very salient questions. That we, have to, we have to look at the Senate as another body and be guided somewhat in their thinking. As but if you did follow on their lead, 
we wouldn't have the Fair Labor Standards Act. We wouldn't have Social Security. We wouldn't have Medicare. We wouldn't have Medicaid. We wouldn't have the Civil Rights Act. We wouldn't have a lot of things that have made a lot of difference to this country if you had to follow the Senate lead. So well, I, don't I, I think it's... Them. I, I, th I, I don't think we should follow. We're an independent body and we yeah. should use our own yeah. judgment. I think the purpose of the Health Care Reform Act not to just to have a, a paper play on it. I don't know. Uh, frankly, I think that the Gephardt bill federalizes the program, and I'm not for it. Let me say, I, I don't think it federalizes the program because what it does, it says that private insurance companies will have to sell their product to everybody in the nation, and they can't discriminate against the people, and that everybody will have to participate in the program. Th th there will probably be Medicare, Medicaid as we know it today will be a thing of the past. So there will be less federalization than you have now because all those Medicaid patients will either end up in private insurance or they will end up in Medicare Part C, which will be administered uh, as, as Medicare is today by the private insurance companies. They, you know, the federal government uh, employs these private insurance companies like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, and all those to administer the Medicare program today. We, we, we do not set up any new bureaucracy. We do not set up any new agency. We do not set up any, any, any and relatively no new taxes, practically none, a little cigarette tax, a very little cigarette tax that's really insignificant as far as this program is concerned. Uh, so, you know, we're not, we're, not, we're not federalizing medical care. In fact, w when you stepped out of the room, I referred to the fact that, that more people will have more choice today, the same kind of choice that you and I have, and you, you mentioned your, your, your open heart surgery, they'll have that kind of choice. Essentially today, most people have to take the health care plan that is given to them by their employer, and they have no choice. You, you know, doctors will tell you, if you go out and listen to them, that five years ago, maybe 10% of their their patient load was managed care. Now, managed care means that the insurance company manages it. Today, 90% of their patient load is managed care. The average American has to take what their employer gives them. Under this program, we say, Mr. Employer, you can give them managed care, but you've also got to give them the option of hiring their own doctor if they want to. Uh, so you expand the rights of people to choose their own physician and their own types of health care in this program, much greater than, than they have an actual choice today. Uh, not many people enjoy the kind of program that you and I enjoy. Uh, most people can't choose their own doctor. They've got to go to the insurance company's doctor today. And we, 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 well, we give, an option. We give them an option to choose their own doctor. I won't pursue it, but... Uh, Sir? I won't pursue it uh, any farther All right. because we're debating the bill and not the rule. Well. But it seems to me that either I've been misinformed or you're explaining the major differently than I understand it. Well, that could be true. You keep the National Health Board? No. You don't have any bureaucratic red tape? You do away with Medi Medicare? Medicaid. Medicaid, Medicaid, the, the program. Oh, no, you said Medicare a while ago. Oh, I, Medicaid. Uh, Medi the, me there has always been problem Expand. in the American system of distinguished between Medicare and Medicaid and there's a lot of fuzzy I know thinking the difference. there. All right. Well, Tennessee we, yeah, I know I know you know that, and, but I was kind of explaining it for the C-SPAN audience here. We do away over a period of time with the Medicaid system. That is a system that has not been effective and it's a government type system. Uh, and and we strengthen Medicare we, we actually give Medicare recipients 
an opportunity to buy, uh, to have health, uh, have coverage for their prescription drugs under the program, and we, ex we expand into Medicare some preventive services that we do not now have in Medicare. So the older folks will be better off, the younger folks will be a heck of a lot better off, the middle income folks will be immeasurably better off because they won't be paying for their share plus everybody else's share as they now do. Well, Sam, I know you And no new bureaucracy. No, no, no new Well, I'm, 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 I'm listening. This man does. Except I don't hear some of the things you're saying. <laughs> I haven't read you. Well, it's, it's there to read, uh, Jimmy. <laughs> it's there to read. <laughs> and and, and well, I've got one other office. thought, and then I'm going to vote, and the chairman's oh. going to put his gavel down. But did, did your committee ever consider asking the health providers, all of them in a room together, the thousands of them, would you agree to set up a pool to have one administration, one claims department, one underwriting department, as we have created pools for atomic energy and the hydrogen bomb and other catastrophic measures. I wonder if they wouldn't be willing to sit down at the table with you and work out a plan that would be... Uh, o o over the years, uh, we have uh, asked them all to come in, and I wouldn't say all of them have come in, but they all had an opportunity to come in, and we have listened to them. Mr. Quillian, I'll tell you, and Mr. Stark is probably almost deaf from having listened to him for many, many years. And we have, tr we, you know, I think you've got to have more of them agree on this than anything they've ever agreed on. Well, I think we have a great uh, uh, system in the country. I think our providers are great. And I don't want to see it federalized. You say no. I want to be sure of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we have a vote going on, uh, and we're going to have, have another vote on the budget, I guess, shortly after. So the committee will be in recess till the hour of 3 o'clock. While the House Rules Committee breaks for a brief recess, here's a few programming notes. Debate on health care reform continues in the Senate. Lawmakers are considering a plan offered by Majority Leader George Mitchell of Maine. The proposal calls for employee mandates to kick in if 90...